Hi everybody, today we are going to talk about Chapter 6, Perception. The first thing to know, understand about perception is it's about kind of our senses and our perception and our neural pathways. And sensation is the stimulation of the sense of organs. Perception is basically the ability to take in and organize the sensory information. So basically trying to make sense of the information that they're gaining. And then the neural pathways are made stronger from sensory experiences. This is one of the reasons why with infants and toddlers we want them to expose to so many different sensory experiences. What sensory integration? This is the process of combining and integrating information across all the senses and it's critical to the development of perception. It helps children apply information learned from one sense to another sense. So one of the things we're wondering is like how do children even demonstrate integration? Well, there's really early sense experience, and the first one is the brain can process tactile sensations by the fourth month in utero, meaning that in utero, the infant can actually feel things. So um, I even remember when I was about very close to the end of my pregnancy, I would poke my finger into the baby, and I could actually feel kicking back. So there was some tactile relationship already forming in utero. Vision is the slowest sense to develop. Um, children, when they are born, have very little vision, and it's usually black and white. Um, as early as seven weeks after conception, there are about 10,000 taste buds appear on the tongue. So by seven weeks, infants can actually start tasting many different things. It's one of the reasons why they say if you're breastfeeding, to um, make sure to eat a variety of different foods, because that... Um, those different foods actually bring different flavors to the breast milk and exposes the infants to different flavors. By 28 weeks in utero, the auditory cortex can perceive loud noises. And at birth, infants can distinguish their mother's smell. They actually know who their mother is based on smell. We know that young babies are especially responsive to high-pitched expressive voices, and this voice is called parentese. And it's basically known as, as baby talk. And we instinctively do it. And we've even seen young children do it. It's very interesting. When young children and adults see a baby, they'll automatically go, oh, you're so cute. And we all raise our voices. Um, infants need exposure to a variety of sounds and quiet time to appreciate the differences in the sounds. And different infants have different needs. And some infants are fine with very loud noises and loudness around them all the time. And some children get overstimulated and need a lot more quietness. And that's something that um, isn't necessarily that develops, but is has to do with temperament. Smell and taste. Newborns can distinguish their mother's scent from other scents. And um, they know it. It's like we can actually see it in them when the mother is holding the infant. And when we're encouraging smell and taste development, don't make things that aren't edible smell delicious. So it's one of those mixed things where we often um, in the past have made um, Play-Doh out of, um, I think it's either Jello or something else that smells really yummy or even peanut butter, but it's not edible. So we're sending really mixed messages because one of the reasons why foods taste good is because they smell good. So we don't also want, we also want to be careful not to condition infants to like the taste of salt because that's also not healthy too. So think about the scents that you find unpleasant and scents that you find enjoyable and that most of those are associated with either food or even think of perfumes and flowers. Um, when we're talking about touch, individual babies vary in their sensitivity to touch. Um, where and how we touch is bound up in culture. And um, tactile perception relates to like motor skills, and it's encouraged by a touchable and mouthable environment. So infants love being able to grab objects and put them in their mouths. And in some cultures, we don't encourage this. We actually, you know, slap it away from their hands and from their mouths and don't want it going in their mouth. But that's how they're exploring their environment. So we actually want to have items available that infants can put in their mouths. It means that we clean them afterwards. So infants, if we're in a childcare center. Many infants can mouth different toys, but we anytime I've seen an infant grab a toy and put it in his mouth and then the infant's done with it, I'll throw it into a dirty, um, a dirty toy bin and know to wash it later in the day. 
We also want to give toddlers words for their tactile sensations, like soft, warm, fuzzy, rough, smooth. And we want to encourage these tactile experiences. We want to provide a sensory tub where they can, like, you know, get into, like, this bin with balls, uh, using sandboxes, water play. Even dress-up activities have to do with very much tactile things, the different materials, or wrapping it around themselves. Be aware that some toddlers don't want to get messy, though, and this may be due to family influence, it may be due to the child's personality, and it may be due to the child's stage of development, and that's okay, but we want to offer them opportunities to get as messy as they want, or offer them like a messy big, you know, daddy t-shirt to put over them so that they don't get messy, the daddy t-shirt gets messy, and that's what they put on every day for like messy activities. So vision. Infants can distinguish light from dark at birth. At a few weeks of age, infants can discriminate among colors. It's one of the reasons why we actually, when you look at infant toys for brand new newborns, everything seems to be black and white and maybe some red, and that's because of what they can see and not see. I remember my young son, he was always staring at this one thing in his bassinet, and I realized it was the warning label because it was white and black. And for infants, the human face is the most interesting object to look at. And you'll, they, you'll notice they oftentimes are looking at your forehead, and that's because they're looking at the contrast between your hair and your um, skin line. So what do you think can happen when there's too much visual stimulation? Oftentimes infants will actually turn inside, they'll go to sleep, they'll turn their head away. So we want to make sure we're not overstimulating and not understimulating. To reduce visual stimulation and encourage beneficial visual interest, you want to put up low barricades to block areas of the toddler room because you're going to set up an infant room separately, like a little bit differently than a toddler room. You want to put photographs of familiar objects or people at the children's eye level. And you want to promote aesthetics. We do want it to look nice, just like, it, you know, we always want to be an environment that looks nice. There are great opportunities for multisensory experiences in the outdoor environment. Um, outdoor settings positively support all the sensory and perceptual domains. Natural light, fresh air, and the sights and sounds of nature contribute to a young child's sensory integration. I love being able to take infants outside, putting them down on a blanket, and letting them just lay there, looking at like the, the leaves of a tree just like kind of flowing in, on top of them, and the sun speckling through the lights washing through the leaves. It's a really wonderful experience for the infants. You can plan for more sensory experiences outdoors. You can allow for individual experiences. Um, you can follow indoor planning guides for outdoor spaces. You can observe, you can encourage the children to observe changes in nature. You can plan sensory motor activities such as moving and building with rocks. You can provide hands-on activities using natural materials like, you know, leaves and um, create outdoor space with vegetation that will encourage the presence of insects, birds, and animals because it's an amazing opportunity for infants and toddlers to see animals in their natural habitat. So watching a caterpillar on a leaf is pretty amazing in the wild, not necessarily in a tank in a classroom. So there are children with special needs that may be in your infant-toddler program. And when we talk about children, infants and toddlers with special needs, there's something called an IFSP. For older children, it's an IEP. But for younger children, it's individualized family service plans. And this is because you can't take an infant-toddler away from their family. They are part of the family. So when we're doing early intervention, we're focusing on the family as a whole. And the IFSP must include the child's present level of physical, cognitive, communication, emotional, social, and adaptive development. Uh, it has to have the family information in it with consent, including the resources that they have um, access to, priorities, and their concerns. Not just our concerns, but the family's concerns. We want to have like major outcomes expected to be achieved, specific early intervention services necessary, the natural environments to provide early intervention services, a written projected timeline, and the steps to be taken to support the child's transitions. So in early intervention, we focus on a lot of different um, the transdisciplinary approach to working with infants and toddlers. So you'll have an early intervention instructor, you'll have a physical therapist, maybe an occupational therapist, a speech therapist, depending on the child's needs, and they're all working together and communicating together as they're working with the family. Part of it is also maybe getting the family some respite care through regional center because the families may need some extra support. So, what are some early warning signs of sensory impairment? Um, infants that frequently rub their eyes or complain that their eyes hurt, avoiding eye contact, easily distracted, often bumps into things or falls frequently like they're not knowing where their body is in space, talks very loudly or very softly, 
shies away from touch, uses one side of the body more than the other, usually turns the same air towards the sound to hear, and reacts strongly to the feel of certain substances or textures. Now, each of these things by themselves would not necessarily make you think, oh my gosh, there's something maybe wrong with this child. But you want to think about it individually. Like when you group these together, if a child has a few of these, that you might be wanting to watch the child and look at their, their development. Now, a very important component to remember is that we are not there to diagnose a child. We're there to maybe notice if there's some issues and refer them to our director, but we are never to like approach the parent and diagnose and say, I think your child has this based on my book that I'm reading and noticing some delays. That's not our role, so be aware of it. But you know, it's important to see if you're noticing some delays and to definitely refer it to your director who would have more expertise in working with the families and approaching them. So now I want you to kind of take your quiz and respond to the um, essay question in the discussion and uh, talk to you in chapter seven.